stocks and bonds are kind of the basic asset allocation, but within those areas, you can get diversified to different industries, different sectors, different geographies. But then there are things like real estate and commodities, emerging markets. These are all good areas to have some exposure to. Hello there and welcome to the My Future Business Show. It's wonderful to have you back with us. And if this is your first time joining us on the show, it's great to uh, have you here. Now on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming the president and founder at capital management firm Sodoxia, Mr. Wade Sloan. Welcome to the show, Wade. Thanks, Rick. Great to be here. Yes, great to have you here. And now you and I are going to be talking about smart money moves and investing, the impacts of current market events on investment choices, and insights into investment options for business owners. But it is customary, as uh, mentioned earlier, Wade, that we start off by uh, talking a little bit about your background. And let's start at the start. Where are you calling in from today? Yes, I'm located here in lovely Newport Beach, Southern California. Oh, beautiful. I love that place. Now, tell me, what do you love about the place? And is that your home? Yes, I've been um, at Newport Beach when I started my firm about 16 years ago. So I'm native to California. Um, I've been back east in the Middle West um, for quite some time, but I've been here in Newport Beach for 15 years. So tell us a little bit about locations and landmarks. What's what's something that's prominent there? Well, um, Orange County is actually spread out pretty broadly. Uh, so it's one beach after another. <laughs> uh, ne next to Newport Beach, you have Laguna Beach. If you go farther north, I used to live in uh, Manhattan Beach and Hermosa Beach, um, going all the way down to San Diego. Uh, probably the biggest landmark in Orange County is probably Disneyland. Oh, yes. Uh, that's about a half hour inland from here. Yep. Uh, but, uh, you know, my kids are grown, so it's been a while since I've been to Disneyland. <laughs> well, I do recall going there many years myself, but uh, I love the place. Now, tell me a little bit about um, your sprint triathlons. I know that they're part of every, everything you do. Now, I couldn't do it myself. <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, I've been involved with sports pretty much my whole life ever since I was a kid. Um, once I got older and I moved back from Kansas City to uh, Orange County about 15 years ago, I connected, as a lot of people do in social media, and connected with one of my high school friends. And he said, hey, Wade, why don't, why don't you come out and play on the basketball team just like their high school days? <laughs> well, I found out very quickly that um, I was much slower. Uh, <laughs> pains were a lot tougher. And so um, I basically retired from uh, recreational basketball in my, uh, let's say, um, early 40s and uh, converted to um, running. And then that, that's when I started dabbling around in uh, triathlons. Uh, it's been a while since I did my last one, but um, it, it, it was a lot of fun, <laughs> and I'm always up for a new challenge um, all the time. Tell me a little bit about the difference between a standard triathlon and a sprint triathlon. Yeah, so they come in different lengths, basically. So yeah. you can think of you know junior varsity, varsity, college, uh, professional. So I started with a sprint triathlon. And, uh, you know, usually I think you finish those in about an hour and then they have uh, you graduate to an Olympic uh, marathon uh, triathlon. And I did one of those. And those are generally two to three hours across, you know, swimming, biking and running. And then after that, um, I never got to the half Ironman or an Ironman. But who knows? Uh, yeah, you never know. <laughs> You never know. I you mean, maybe, know. maybe that'll be in my future. Absolutely. Loving the feedback. Now, I know as a, as a traveler myself, I get this bug and I need to go places. Now, I know that you've been to, what, what is it, 25 different countries? Tell us a little bit a little bit about your travel journeys. Sure. Yeah, it's probably expanded a little bit since, um, since then. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, my mother uh, grew up in Germany. And as, as you uh, probably know, um, the Europeans love to travel, so it was kind of part of, part of my childhood and growing up, um, just that um, real keen interest in getting exposed to new cultures and new areas, just that idea of adventure. 
Uh, you know, a lot of people here, especially in California, kind of get trapped in a bubble just because it, it really is a nice place to live and there's a lot to do here. But, um, you know, really deprives people of, you know, getting out of their out of their comfort zone and seeing new cultures and, um, you know, experiencing new people and that type of thing. So, um, yeah, so I've, I try, at, I would say over the last, you know, 10, 20 years, uh, try to do at least one big trip a year. Yeah. Um, most recently, um, I kind of ticked off um, an area I've never been to, which was Croatia. Oh. And then we also went to uh, Montenegro. And um, I'd been to Greece, but Santorini was kind of the highlight of the trip. So, um, you know, there's what's in store next. Um, you know, I have nice. a few ideas, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm always looking to try to do one big trip a year if, if possible. Now, I remember um, going to some places around this big, wide, wonderful world of ours and always feeling a sense of gratitude because we seem to have uh, a better understanding, a different perspective, at least, of how lucky we are. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I think um, probably a lot of people um, that you interview, <laughs> um, uh, you know, they, they may not all be in the uh, top one or two percent, but um, let's just say the top half. <laughs> and uh, yeah, when you get exposed to different areas, um, you uh, you realize that you do take certain things for granted mm. and getting exposed to uh, some of those different areas, um, yeah, makes you appreciate what, what you do have. So yeah, I would agree with that statement. Absolutely. Thank you for the feedback. I, I also think about, you know, you touched on culture a little earlier, Wade, and I think what is something that's common given your vast and wide travels that is common between all of us, do you think? <laughs> well, and in the investing world, um, I, I think um, you realize that people are very um, emotional and, <laughs> and passionate. Yep. I mean, we talked a little bit about sports. I mean, um, you know, Europeans and soccer, uh, it's just a whole different um, level. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a religion. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, we have our NFL football here. Um, but, uh, no, I think, um, you know, even from a business standpoint, um, you know, emotions and behavioral aspects and culture and economics and politics, um, it all plays into, you know, how we look at companies, investments and trends and, you know, having a global perspective and understanding how globalization works and uh you know just from basic i mean your audience and listeners they they they're familiar with the iphone <laughs> <laughs> and you know hundreds of millions of people using these things and how it connects people so uh yeah i mean i think there's a, a lot of common commonality and with globalization um the the linkage is is even getting tighter and i think it'll get even tighter over time yeah, absolutely. Great feedback. Now, I know that uh, it's one thing to travel abroad, but tell us a little bit about your 5,000 mile RV trip. How was that like? <laughs> yeah, so this was at the tail end. Um, I was managing a $20 billion fund at American Century in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits we had as employees is you could take a sabbatical. Oh. So uh, I took uh, uh, almost a full month and got into an RV in the Midwest. And, um, you know, not everything works out as it uh, should on paper. <laughs> uh, at the time, my kids were uh, two years old and five years old. And uh, oh. you can imagine uh, going 5,000 miles um, trapped in a uh, house on wheels <laughs> and uh, create some adventure. But uh, looking back, even with some of the uh, complications we faced, um, <laughs> You know, it was a really memorable experience, and um, even even for my kids, more more my older daughter, uh, you know, they can look back. And um, I'm actually, uh, besides a travel enthusiast, I'm a photo book enthusiast. So uh, that that whole trip is captured in I don't know a, a 40, 50 page book, yeah, and so bet. my kids can look back and 
you know, remember remember it fondly. Isn't that funny? You know, we 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 suffer at the time, but they're they're memories that we would never uh, give away, or we we would happily do again. Now we've talked about your traveling abroad and 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 locally, but what else is on the bucket list for you? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, from a travel perspective, I mean, it's it's kind of endless. So mm. um, in the short run, I'm looking at Iceland and Scandinavia. I've never, never tried part of the area. But um, from a broader standpoint, um, for me as a business owner, individual, it's all about life balance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, you can never really achieve it, but it's kind of a moving target. So you know, we, we just went through the new year. There's always, you know, New Year's resolutions. <laughs> but um, it is a goal for me um, to not not only try to excel at business, but also to be uh, present with my family and all my relationships. Um, I want to keep a balance with my friends. And then, you know, also personally, uh, you, you know, you have to uh, keep, <laughs> keep sane and, um, and, and calm, especially in my industry, there's a lot of stress involved. So, you know, I want to pr- give myself personal time. When people do that differently, um, it, it could be uh, religion. You know, we talked about, you know, triathlons. And mm-hmm. so I think exercise is kind of a win-win situation as far as uh, stress management and yep. also for health and longevity. So I'm a big believer in, you know, making sure I have personal time for myself so um, yeah, as far as bucket list, um, there there's it's ongoing. You know, kind of, uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a journey, <laughs> and I'm you know trying to check off buckets in in each of those categories and and maintain uh, you know a work work life balance. Well, Wade, you're looking good, and I, I can tell you look after yourself. Um, tell me a little bit about your daily routine. Are you up early, and what's your diet look like? What do you what are you into? Sure, yeah, I. I think I got in the wrong profession as far as my physical location because the <laughs> yeah. uh, on the West Coast here the stock market opens at six thirty a.m. I, I should have probably started my professional c- career on the East Coast. Uh, they start at nine thirty a.m. They get the jump um, on you. But uh, yeah, I, I usually get up um, when the market opens at about six thirty a.m. and uh, basically looking at all the investments in the portfolios that we manage to see if there are any fires with our investments. Are there any decisions that we need to make? But for the most part, we're long-term investors. And, um, you know, I, I, most of my clients, um, they're, they don't wake up for a few more hours. So yeah. um, it's kind of a peace, uh, calm before the storm in the morning. Um, but beyond that, um, I, uh, I do like to get some exercise routine into my daily uh, regimen when it could be it could be in the morning, it could be in the afternoon, um, it could be in the evening. So I'm real flexible. I do uh, yoga occasionally. Yep. Yep. Um, running is a very convenient thing. I don't have to uh, go to the gym and drive. I just literally put on my uh, running shoes. And away and, you go. The door and it's it's really difficult uh, <laughs> to do. I can't say that I love it. I, I love the feeling when I finish. Um, yes. So anyway, I, I do try to uh, do that. And then as far as diet goes, um, yes, I I do have some uh, family health history that um, makes it important that I have to keep on top of that. Mm-hmm. So uh, I I do try to eat um healthier (laughs) not not a lot of red meat Mm -hmm. um and try to introduce more fruits and vegetables into my diet but i definitely do love food and i do have cheat days yes me too and uh, (laughs) i do have a sweet tooth but uh yeah for today uh so far i've had an acai bowl if you know what that is no i don't (laughs) but there you go a little hungry, but um, not sure what's on the dinner menu. Well, it's just around the corner, I'm sure. Now, tell me, you just touched on discipline. And I think about how disciplined you must be in terms of running a triathlon. And, you know, you talked about not liking the experience when you have to do it, but you do it anyway. It's it's a committed person. It's somebody who recognizes recognizes the value of persistence and discipline. Tell me a little bit about how important that is for you. 
Yeah, I think uh, that's a big part of it. Um, a, a big part of it is just uh, the competitive nature. That, that's what's really exciting to me. So when I get up every morning, um, I'm in a very unique industry where um, we get judged and measured every day. And it's kind of like a sport. Mm. Um, and uh, the same goes with, you know, these triathlons and competitions um, and just uh, – and part of the competition is is the scale. <laughs> yeah. So I I get on the scale every day. So to me, I'm constantly measuring whether it's professionally with my investments, my clients, my business. Um, personally, yeah, I need to make sure um, you know that my weight's good. I have to make sure that my cholesterol levels You're are correct. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's it's a it's a competition to to stay healthy to be. Um, be in the shape that I can do the things that I want to do. Cause you know, I, I, I do enjoy life. I want to yeah. be around for a long time. And so, yeah, it does require discipline, but I, you know, I enjoy just the, uh, the competitive Nature. part of it. I'm, yeah. I'm a very competitive yeah. person. Well, I've, I know that this is why the My Future Business Show is fundamentally different from most other uh, business-related podcasts is because we take a bit of a deep dive into your personal life, so I really do appreciate it. Now, I think that's a really good segue into uh, educational professional background. Tell us a little bit about that. What sort of qualifications do you have behind you? Sure. Yeah, uh, you know, thanks to my mom. Uh, my mom was a widow, and she brought up um, me and my two brothers and so uh, education was very important. Uh, my two older brothers were kind of mentors to me. I kind of chased and, um, you know, bit their ankles trying to keep <laughs> up with them. Um, so I, um, after high school, I went to college at UCLA, um, the University of California, Los Angeles. I was an economics major and uh, I cut my teeth. Um, for a few years um, for an investment company called William O'Neill. Uh, they're based in Southern California. Um, he was the brains behind Investor's Business Daily newspaper, which is kind of a Wall Street Journal competitor. So I did that for two years, got some great experience, and then used that to get my master's, my MBA degree at Cornell University in upstate New York. Um, along with that, um, the investment industry is kind of a unique industry as far as credentials and certifications. Um, and quite frankly, um, there, there aren't really a lot of stringent uh, requirements. A lot of it is voluntary. So uh, believe it or not, and it's part of the reason we got into the 2008 uh, financial crisis is because there wasn't a lot of regulation. And, you know, I would argue today there still isn't enough. Mm. Um, but I I voluntarily got what's called a CFA, a Chartered Financial Analyst. And what that is, is kind of an inch wide, mile deep into investments. So a lot of people um, that work on Wall Street, um, people that did uh, do what I do and did what I did, which was, you know, manage billions of dollars, had this um, very specific credential. And that, not, not that it's required, but mm. gives you a lot of knowledge in the space. Um, beyond that, I have what's also called the CFP, uh, Certified Financial Planner. This is a little bit more common. It's still a minority of investment advisors in the industry, and it's more of a mile-wide, inch-deep of knowledge across everything from investments to estate planning, tax planning, um, insurance, et cetera. It's, a, it's kind of a broad dive. Broad dive and that, yeah. that's another multi-year program. So the, those are some of my um, certifications and my educational background. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing. Um, tell me a little bit about the different types of investments and what does Sodoxia focus on? Yeah, I mean, we do um, primarily invest for high net worth individuals and uh, we do also manage money for businesses. You can think of things like 401k plans or pension plans. And yeah, as far as the specific investments, uh, we invest in individual stocks, we invest in individual bonds, um, government securities, um, things called ETFs, exchange traded funds mm -hmm. or index funds. And 
you know, you talk to uh, 10 different investment professionals and you'll get 10 different opinions on what's the best way to invest. Um, our religion at Sedoxia is low cost, tax efficient, long term time horizon. You can kind of think of a Warren Buffett uh, type of a philosophy to investing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's worked very well for me over my 30 plus year investment career. Well, I'd love to explore that a little more, but I also want to know where did the name Sedoxia come from? I love it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because uh, as you can imagine, um, just like there are a lot of podcasters um, out there and um, interview people that you, um, you uh, swim around with um, <laughs> in the investment industry, there are literally hundreds and thousands of different firms out there. So when you're coming up with a name for your business, um, especially in the investment industry, you come across a lot of things like um, Everest Capital Management yep. or Pinnacle or Peak or all, all these different ways of trying to uh, uh, create an analogy of growth. Uh, at, at American Century, it was a tree. So Sedoxia is a name I came up with, uh, was derived from the Greek word for optimism, uh, Asiodoxia. And so I, I kind of uh, chopped it down a little bit and uh, Sedoxia is where we arrived. So tell me a little bit about your ideal client. I know you've talked about high net worth um, individuals, but even if they're high net worth individuals in terms of, um, I guess, uh, the way they go about investing, they've come to you for a reason. Do you, uh, is it oftentimes the case that they may not have the appropriate education? Yeah, I mean, uh, the way I like to describe it is, you know, people understand that certain areas of their life can be very complex. Mm. Um, and, you know, taxes is, is one of them. So a lot of people can do it yourself, but a lot of people understand the complexities of doing that. And the same goes with an estate plan, or maybe it's your kitchen that you want to renovate. Mm. And, uh, yeah, we, we talked earlier about the idea of outsourcing. So a lot of people, they don't have the time, interest, the emotional fortitude to do <laughs> investing. Um, yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of like Warren Buffett said, investing is kind of like dieting. It's it's very easy to understand, but difficult to achieve. And so, um, yeah, we, we're happy to do it for others, um, for people that don't have the time, interest, or emotional uh, fortitude to do it. I'd love to talk about portfolios and whether or not a new investor should have a diversified portfolio or should they just start off in one stream? Yeah, no, I think that's a very important point. Uh, and what we do at Sedoxia is we try to create a customized, uh, we call it an, an IPS, an investment mm. policy statement. So everyone's at a different stage in their life. We have clients um, in their early 30s. They may be you know, attorneys, consultants, or entrepreneurs. And then we have clients that are well into their retirement. And so their portfolios may look wildly different, but the commonality is what you pointed out is uh, you, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to be diversified. And we, what we really try to achieve is an income stream that is appropriate uh, for each individual client. So if you're in retirement, um, we set up portfolios to spin off cash flow and income so that clients can uh, live the lives that they want. And we try to streamline it and make it really convenient and easy for them. Uh, for people that are younger, I plan on working uh, as long as I can, hopefully for decades, um, if I'm healthy enough. Mm. And so I don't really need a lot of access to income. So I'm going to have a higher risk tolerance um, than some other clients. Mm. So, um, and you know, client situations change and adjust over time. So we're, we're very open and we do it periodically. It's just, we, we don't want to be uh, changing the objectives of our clients on a constant basis, but we, we customize these diversified portfolios for all our clients. 
So you touched on something that's re of really uh, a lot of interest to me. I, I talk, I think about risk profiles. How do you know um, when somebody uh, approaches you and they're looking to invest, what sort of risk profile that they actually have? What's the process for working that out? <laughs> yeah, it, it is a difficult uh, thing to pinpoint uh, because what you find out, as I talked about before, uh, the, the commonality with most individuals is greed and fear. Uh, yep. <laughs> and so, you know, in periods where the, the stock market is volatile, uh, people become very fearful. And, um, you know, as Warren Buffett said, you buy fear and you sell greed. But most um, individual investors, they operate differently. So when the market's going up, they say, hey, Wade, you know, I have a high risk tolerance. Like, let's get into all these technology stocks. Let's <laughs> do it. And then the market tanks. And they go, you know what, Wade? I'm very conservative. I just want to preserve wealth. <laughs> Cause and effect. Right. And so uh, that risk tolerance can change over time. So we try to be really upfront um, with uh, our clients and prospective clients is to explain how we invest. And we try to prepare them for rocky waters because um, inevitably that's what happens. And so when the waves start crashing, you try to remind investors like, okay, things are on sale for 20% off. Now's not the time to panic, knee jerk, sell. Now's the time to reinvest, redeploy those gains that we harvested uh, when everything was sunny, bright, and clear. And uh, so that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, you know that risk tolerance, we kind of operate like therapists and try to educate and really understand. But um, the short answer for most people, um, we can figure out within the first five minutes just from the questions yep. <laughs> that clients and prospective clients ask whether they're really risk takers. And, you know, we want to understand their financial situation. We want to recommend, um, you know, how much risk they can or how much risk they should take. But at the end of the day, it's their money and we just want to make sure there's a common understanding of the strategy and the risk that we're taking um, currently and you know review it periodically it seems to me that the only uh, constant in investing is that everything is always variable we've just talked yeah. about risk profiles and i'm wondering what's the frequency at which you would review or um, come at, uh, sit down with an existing client to go over the numbers again and look at their portfolios is it annually biannually how does that work yeah no i mean it's an ongoing basis so you know it's important for us to communicate with our clients constantly so we do that on a quarterly basis where we reach out, we give a summary of all the investments. I do a video kind of state of the union um, video report and talk about the changes we made, uh, investments that have outperformed, investments that have underperformed, what's going on in the financial markets. And then uh, we leave it up to the clients if they have questions to contact us. But from a regulatory standpoint, we're also required um, to every few years to actively reach out to the clients and say, hey, you know, you're currently in a moderate portfolio or you're an aggressive or conservative portfolio. Have your circumstances changed? Um, do you want to change your risk profile or uh, your asset allocation is the, um, you know, industry term? So, yes, um, at a minimum, um, every few years, uh, we, we need to meet with the clients and make sure that they're comfortable. That's yeah, great feedback. Thank okay. you very much, Wade. Now, when we have an inexperienced person that comes to you, how do you help them make smart investment choices? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, for people that outsource, like I said, they, they're they focused on what, what's important to them. That could be work, it could be family, it could be their personal lives. And so a uh, vast majority of people say like, Wade, here's, here's <laughs> my life savings. Don't lose it. Huh. Make me some money. Um, <laughs> But as far as helping them um, make good decisions and not to make rash or emotional decisions, I don't think any of us make uh, our best decisions when we're emotional, is for clients to really understand. So I think a lot of people in the industry, um, they try to make things sound more complicated than they are. Yeah. So we want to make sure that clients are comfortable in asking questions. There's no such thing as asking dumb questions. Um, I think of myself when I go to the auto 
uh, repair man. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have no idea. He could tell me, you know, your thing of a Bob um, has been broken and it's going to cost you this, this and that. So it's very much a trust based business, but um, I approach that same situation um, to find the professional that I work best with is, okay, could you explain to me what what's broken? How did it happen? Can you show me? Um, and so when you can kind of understand in layman's terms what's going on, you're going to feel more comfortable. Yep. And I think the relationship uh, with your client is or customer is going to last longer so that that's what we try to achieve is just a basic understanding of what we're doing you don't have to understand all the nuts and bolts but um, make sure that your questions are understand in terms that you can relate to are there common asset classes you know the likes of gold and 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 things like that that people should always invest in and are there others right now i guess with global volatility that they should avoid yeah um we talked about diversification earlier and i think it is important so um you know stocks and bonds are kind of the the basic asset allocation but within those areas you can you know get diversified to different industries different sectors different geographies different risk capital structures um, but then there are things like real estate and commodities uh, emerging markets I think these are all good areas to have some exposure to. And with a lot of these multinational companies, um, they, they operate in over a hundred countries. Yeah. And so you're getting a lot of diversification just by investing in one company. Uh, as far as areas that we try to stay away from, um, we try to stay away from anything that's hot, <laughs> anything mm. that you're reading about or hearing about all the time people that are looking to make money get rich um, right away. And we, we get those questions all the time. So some of those hot areas that we try to shy away from um, would be things like, you know, for a while it was the the cannabis stocks. Yep. You know, here, here in the U.S., different states are legislating and uh, making things um, legal and expanding access, et cetera. Uh, the same goes with this uh, cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. So we, we get this question almost every day. You know, what do you think of Bitcoin or, you know, there are literally hundreds of these currencies and they're coming out every day. Every day. Um, yeah. And so, yes, we're a little bit more conservative and would urge people to, uh, you know, shy away uh, for things like gold, for example. Um, we're perfectly OK having, a, you know, a small exposure uh, but uh, we're not necessarily big gold bugs either. Tell me a little bit about the, uh, I guess, the software and AI space. Is there room for that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that is a trend. And, you know, as business owners and studying literally thousands of business, what you understand is that the largest cost for um, the vast majority of businesses are people. And the, the thing that's been going on for decades is the uh, slow and incessant expansion of technology because technology reduces the cost of um, employees and also makes employees um, and people more productive. And so with AI, um, you know, I'm a little bit, uh, I guess, cautious about um, any of these things, any of these buzzwords as far as the pace of adoption. And mm. so I don't think AI is going to happen overnight and robots are going to be running our lives, but every business and every industry is being impacted. And essentially what it is, is it's just software. So I just tell people to think about whenever they hear about AI, <laughs> it's yeah. just software. We've lived for uh, decades and a generation uh, you may have heard of Moore's Law, which basically says that computing power doubles every 12 to 18 months. And so we've had this explosion of computer power. And, um, you know, quite frankly, it took uh, a decade uh, or two for the software to catch up. So with this chat GPT, what you're seeing is certain applications of the software where it's catching up to the computing power. 
and it's um, it's not stopping, you know. No. And that's why you're seeing, you know, whether it's in biotechnology, if it's in media and entertainment, um, if it's retail, it's impacting all industries. So yes, we are definitely focused on this area. We're investing in that area, and we're looking for companies and industries that not only um, don't have to be creating the AI technology, but are, are using it um, to grow their business and their profits. What I think is important that I'm taking away from this call is that um, Sodoxia must be all about information. Where is it that you're sourcing the, the wide array of global information on what's a great investment, long-term, short-term, all of this information that you must have so that you can help people, help investors make informed decisions? What's your sources? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's really been a information revolution because, you know, anybody at their computer has access to this information. <laughs> yep. And uh, the, the internet is just so... Uh, pervasive. Um, but um, a lot of this information, and most people don't know it, it's it's right in front of them in their computer, is, uh, you know, these thousands of companies that we follow, publicly traded stocks, um, have are mandatorily required to release information, um, not only quarterly, but whenever there are other changes. So, uh, you've probably heard of the SEC, the Security and Exchange mm -hmm. Commission. Uh, they require all these companies to file all these public filings. And, um, you know, Warren Buffett used to talk about uh, what he would love to do Friday nights is to curl up with a nice annual report <laughs> or 10K. And, um, you know, the, these are for us geeks uh, that are really interested in finding the next um Apple computer or mm -hmm. NVIDIA or, uh, yeah, Amazon, um, to really dig into the details and understand how companies operate. But um, in order to do a lot of this um, detailed in the weeds analysis, you, it does require some education and training in the, the basic language of um, business is accounting. And so, uh, you know, it's probably the most boring class that I had um, in college and business school, but the most valuable. So a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is I'm crunching and looking through the numbers, but also reading about strategy, new products, expanding into new geographies. There's just like an endless amount of information. And <laughs> each, each one of these companies, uh, you just go to their website and they have presentations and recordings. You can really go down a lot of rabbit holes and get tons of information to become an expert on a lot of these companies. Great feedback, thanks again, Wade. Now, I wonder, given that we're moving away from a, uh, a more towards a cashless society, you know, credit cards abound everywhere, how does that impact uh, investing options and choices that people make? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a great point. We're actually an investor in Visa. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of your listeners use that, but um, yeah, and you can see it with, you know, younger generation, uh, you know, I have kids and, you know, they're using Venmo and everything's no, nobody carries cash anymore. They go out to dinner and they'll they'll split the dinner up five ways over their cell phones. Yeah. So, yeah, everything definitely is moving from cash um, to digital and electronic. Um, you know, there there's certainly some risks, um, you know, regulatory wise because <laughs> these, you know, whether it's MasterCard or Visa, uh, they, you know, essentially have oligopolies and, um, but the convenience factor is, is undeniable. Um, and, you know, with all this talk about cryptocurrency, um, you know, the government and the Federal Reserve, they've been talking about a digital currency. So it wouldn't surprise me at some point um, if, you know, countries and governments set up their own digital currencies um, to try to take advantage of these trends. So yes, mm. I, I, do th I do think that is a, a trend that will be seen in the coming um, years and decades. Tell us a little bit about your perspective on real estate. Is it still a solid option? Yeah, it's, yeah especially here in the US, it's been a really interesting phenomenon which has been going on because you know the economy has been slowing. The Fed has had these massive interest rate increases and you would think from the outside looking in that they would just absolutely destroy the real estate, especially the residential real estate market. Mm. 
And uh, the surprising factor has been that um, nobody is moving or selling their homes. So there's literally, you know, historically, generously low historical levels of inventory because people don't want to sell their home because they have a three, three and a half percent mortgage. Because if they sell their home, guess what? I'm going to have to roll into like a seven, you know, it got up to 8% mortgage. And all of a sudden my mortgage payment is going to be 50% higher. So um, yes, I think the residential real estate is, is for the time being is very solid fundamentally because there just aren't homes. And there is, if you look at demographics and the expanding of, uh, you know, the generation, I guess, Y and Z, these, you know, uh, adults in their thirties, um, looking to buy a home. There's, there's a, a very captive audience that is chomping at the bit to move out of mom's house or yeah. apartment and, and get into a house. So yes, in the, in the short run, we, we think it's, uh, it's, it's a good market. We've talked about, you know, trying to make some money, putting some money down and getting a return on our investment. But how much is enough money when you're at that retirement <laughs> stage? Honestly, is there yeah, a cap I, that people should be looking at? Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough going back to what we talk about. Everyone's situation is a little bit different. Um, interest rates. So the, the way that we look at investments and the stock market, um, there are four key factors and um, it's. Um, interest rates, uh, valuations, which is just another term for the price. Uh, if you're looking at a house, yep. um, the, the price is very important. Um, and also is growth. So when you're looking at a business, um, whether you're looking to buy or sell and at what price it's going to depend on, is it growing? Is it declining? Um, is it stagnant? And that'll depend on the price. And then uh, in the stock market, sentiment. Um, and it's kind of a contrarian indicator. So when people are very greedy, like I said, that's when you want to be more cautious. Yeah. And when people are um, ready to jump out the window, that's when you know the vultures come in and they scoop things up for pennies on the dollar. Yeah. Um, but there, there is no specific return. Um, it really depends on the situation. If you're younger in your life and you don't need access to your money and you have a longer term time horizon, then you're going to be looking for a higher return. The, the stock market over the last hundred years has averaged probably eight to 10%. Uh, but if you're retired and you're looking more at capital preservation and income generation, um, you may well live comfortably earning, you know, five or 6% um, and being able to sleep at night as the stock market tanks, you're, um, investment portfolio is going to be, uh, you know, have the shock absorbers to withstand okay. that yep. and it's, it's not going to move as much. And so we, we really try to balance that risk reward and return uh, based on the, the time horizon and income needs of each client. I'm really enjoying this call, Wade. It's been fantastic. Now, I'm wondering if we could um, talk a little bit about the investments that may be available to business owners. Yeah, so uh, for business owners, I think um, the the real low hanging fruit, especially if you have the cash flow to do it, is to set up a retirement plan for your company. So that would be setting up a four hundred one k. So for a lot of small businesses, um, you know, there's you start at the the bottom level, which is kind of your IRA, the individual retirement account, and uh, you know those those. Uh, contribution limits go up every year, but you know, let's call it, you know, six, $7,000 a year is, is that's not going to really get you to retirement. Um, the next level is, is establishing a, a 401k and it could be what they call a solo K. So you can be a solo practitioner. And what happens is you can shelter tens and tens of thousands of dollars each year. And it's a win win because all your contributions, uh, lower your taxes, but you're also giving money to yourself for your retirement. Yeah. And once you get into retirement, typically your tax rate's going to be lower. So when you're withdrawing the money and taking money out for taxes, um, you know, in many cases it's at a lower rate. So it's, it's a win-win. And then, you know, there's levels you can graduate beyond that, a pension plan you can set up for your company and you can shelter 
uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in certain cases. So that's kind of a low hanging fruit area for uh, business businesses to, uh, you know, invest. And it's also a client, I mean, a customer, I'm sorry, an employee um, retention tool. Mm -hmm. uh, so not, not only as you're giving benefits to your employees, are you helping to retain them? Um, but, it, you know, it's a business expense that lowers your taxes as well. There is just so much that we could talk about. And I know that the information um, runs deep in Sodoxia. Now, tell me a little bit about uh, the, the team at Sodoxia. I'm sorry, say that again, please. Tell us a little bit about the team at Sodoxia. The team? The team, the people that are working within your... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> your, accent, your accent is coming through. Yeah, the team. So I have um, a few employees um, that work with me. Um, I kind of have a chief operating officer, Kevin Weaver, and he, he wears a lot of different hats. Um, he does a lot of the uh, financial planning. Mm -hmm. So as you can kind of tell from our conversation, I'm really interested in the investments and that's what I've been doing for 30 years. Yep. I'm also a financial planner and I can, you know, come in with my expertise and perspective. Uh, Kevin does that. He handles a lot of the operations or client retention. Um, you know, Rick, you specifically worked with uh, Civi, <laughs> our, uh, our client administration um, professional. And so she, interacts with um, uh, a lot of our clients and offloads some of the administrative tasks. We also have a, a tax partner, um, Keith. Um, so when we have tax questions, he can he can help us out. But overall, it's a relatively small team. Um, we manage over 100 million in assets, um, which in the whole scheme of things is relatively small compared to the billions of dollars um, that I managed on that large fund. Um, but we continue to grow. I love what I do and I hope to be doing this for uh, many, many, many years, years to, come. to come. I wonder, how does it make you feel when you see uh, results coming through for your clients? It must make you feel good. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. There's, you know, like I said, it can be an emotional roller coaster if you, uh, you know, get too involved on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, having been in the business, um, at Sodoxia for 16 years now. Um, it, it, it is personally satisfying um, to see, you know, clients reach their objectives and, you know, be really appreciative of, you know, the value that we offer and the guidance um, and advice and investments that we make. And so, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of pressure and responsibility. Um, and, but um, just like I'm sure, uh, you do in your business and a lot of other business owners do, uh, you develop real um, tight knit relationships with a lot of these clients. And, um, you know, um, I, I don't really take myself seriously, but I take my business and my clients very seriously. And so, um, yes, it, it definitely is fulfilling, um, especially, um, you know, for our long term clients. Now, when people want to find more information, I know that you've also got a, I guess, a side website called Investing Caffeine. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so uh, like a lot of uh, business owners that you talk to, <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, challenges in starting a business. So when I started coming from this $20 billion fund and starting my own business, I literally had you know, zero clients and started from scratch. So I had to kind of use my blood, sweat and tears. And so that's when I um, started writing. I never was a, a writer. Um, I did a, did a blog for that 5,000 mile RV trip. And some people said, hey, wait, you can you, you can write. I said, oh, I didn't know you could. OK, <laughs> well, I started my blog and that's what investing caffeine is. And so, you know, people can go there, they can sign up for our monthly newsletter. Uh, but basically, I used to write four or five times a month when I didn't have any clients. <laughs> um, now, right now I write once a month and kind of give my overview on what's going on, um, you know, in the financial markets and, and trends and opportunities that we see. So it's, it's a good resource um, to kind of get a, 
an idea of what we're thinking and what's going on in the world. It's a great resource. I've had a look at it. It's a real credit to you. Now, um, importantly, when people who are on this call today want to find out more information about Sodoxia and more information about you and your team, uh, where are they going to go? Yeah, I mean, I think the best place is to go to our website, which is sodoxia.com. It's S as in Sam, I, D as in David, O, X, I, A.com. And uh, yeah, there you can learn about the firm, our background, our services. Um, you can give us a call, our phone number, all our contact information's there. Uh, there's a lot of our, our blog is <laughs> integrated in there. So yeah, there, there's a lot of interesting um, information if you want to learn more about our firm, our services. There you go. If you're on today's call, you've enjoyed it, you want to learn some more, go to sodoxia.com. I'll be making sure that uh, the link is available below this call. No matter where you see it, it's just going to be a click of a button to get through to Wade and his wonderful team uh, to learn more about investing in all sorts of different asset classes. And with that being said, Wade, thank you so very much for joining me on the show today today. Thank you, Rick. My pleasure.